Bat Shalom, everyone. We are gathered today on the 21st of the ninth month on our Creator's calendar, which happens to line up with November 14th, or I'm sorry, I'm way off, December 2nd on the Gregorian calendar for 2023. And we're going to take a little segue here. This is from an old Facebook post that we had put together a while ago on the importance of being mindful or being careful who we listen to when it comes to hearing his word. And it says, understanding the scriptures from the heart and mind of the author, Yahuwah, no falsehood, no compromise. But he, Mashiach answering, said it has been written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahuwah. And that's Matith Yahu 4.4. 4. Okay, it's the truth from his, from his mouth, right? That is the blueprint for how we're supposed to be. Now, it says, This is a series of scriptures on who we should listen to and what we should do to learn truth and the importance and reasons for staying in scripture and not other writings that are contrary. This is a quote from an unknown author, but I thought it was very, very beneficial. It says, first, let no one rule your mind or body. Take special care that your thoughts remain unfettered. Give, e give men your ear, but not your heart. Show respect to those in power, but don't follow them blindly. Judge with logic and reason, but comment not. Consider none your superior, whatever their rank or station in life. Treat all fairly, or they will seek revenge. Be careful with your money, hold fast to your beliefs, and others will listen. Wise, no, I simply learned to think. And I quote the whole thing for you because that's how I had read it, and I thought, if you don't have his word, these are pretty sound things. If you're a believer, you're not going to be seeking revenge but that's not how everyone you know behaves okay now what follows is all from his word on how we should listen and what we should do to learn the truth okay futility futility said the koheleth or the preacher assembler literally all is futile and besides being wise Koheleth also taught the people knowledge, and he listened and sought out, set in order many proverbs. Koheleth sought to find out words of delight and words of truth rightly written. The words of the wise are like goads, and as nails driven by the master of collections, they were given by one shepherd. And apart from these, my son, be warned, the making of many books has no end. And much study is wearying of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear Elohim and guard his commands, for this applies to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work into right ruling, or judgment, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. That's Koheleth or Ecclesiastes 12, 8-14. This is Recognitions of Clement, Book 3, starting at Chapter 62. And it's titled Life of the Nazarim, or the Branches, which is the title, one of the two titles that we have in Scripture for believers, other than, if you want to, Messianics. And the other, other than the Nazarim or the Nazarenes, you would have the followers of the way. But it says, Yet Kepha... This would be Shimon Kepha, or what we commonly known as Simon Peter, okay? Yet Kepha said, Who is he that is earnest toward instruction, and that studiously inquires into every particular, except him who loves his own soul, or his own spirit to deliverance, and renounces all the affairs of this world, that he may have leisure to attend to the word of Yahuwah only? Such is he whom alone Yahushua deems wise, even he who sells all that he has and buys the one true pearl, who comprehends what is the difference between temporal things and ageless, small and great, men and Yahuwah. 
for he comprehends what is the ageless hope in presence of the true and good Yahuwah. But who is he that loves Yahuwah save him who knows his hokmah or wisdom? And how can anyone obtain knowledge of Yahuwah's wisdom unless he is constant in hearing his word? Whence it comes that he conceives a love for him and venerates him with worthy honor, pouring out hymns and prayers to him, and most pleasantly resting in these, accounting it his greatest damage if at any time he speak or do aught else even for a moment of time, because in reality the Ruach or the soul, it should say, that is filled with the love of Yahuwah can neither look upon anything except what pertains to Yahuwah, nor by reason of love of him, can be satisfied with meditating upon those things that it knows to be pleasing to him. It should say, except by, right? Yet those who have not conceived affection for him, nor bear his love lighted up in their mind, are as it were placed in darkness and cannot see light. And therefore, even before they begin to learn anything of Yahuwah, they immediately faint as though worn out by labor and filled with weariness, they are straightway hurried by their own peculiar habits to those words with which they are pleased. For it is wearisome and annoying to such persons to hear anything about Yahuwah. And for that reason, I have stated, or, and for the reason, and sorry, and that for the reason I have stated, because their mind has received no sweetness of El breathed love. Philippians 4. 4 through 13. Rejoice in Yahuwah always. Again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Yahuwah is near. Do not worry at all, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to Elohim. And the shalom of Elohim, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds through Mashiach Yahushua. For the rest, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is righteous, whatever is clean, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, if there is any uprightness and if there is any praise, think on these. And what you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, practice these. And the Elohim of Shalom shall be with you. Yet I rejoiced in Yahuwah greatly that now at last your concern for me has revived again, though you were concerned but had no chance. Not that I speak concerning need, for I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I know what it is to be humbled, and I know what it is to have in excess. In any and every situation I have learned both to be filled and to be hungry, both to have in excess and to be in need. I have strength to do all through Mashiach, who empowers me. Yahuda, commonly called Jude, chapter 1, 1 through 25. Yahuda, a servant of Yahushua Mashiach, and brother of Yaakov, to those who are called, set apart by Elohim the Father, that's the elect. And um, there's a lot of information we just don't know anymore. The history behind this letter in particular, the context of who he's writing to, the events that were going on at the time, we're not very cognizant of. The, the actual facts of Scripture, we don't really have a sound grip on in all parts of it. One of the main things here, for anyone who wants to pay attention, is the scriptural distinction between Yahuda and Yisrael, or the house of Yahuda and the house of Yisrael, or the kingdom of Yahuda and the kingdom of Yisrael, or the whole house of Yisrael, or Yaakov. Ephraim and Yaakov, what they mean, why they're used, what the difference is, we don't really make those nuances of distinction, but his word is legally defining terms 
and foretelling events that have actually happened. And if you don't know what these terms are, then you can be confused. If you don't really know history, then you have no idea what he's talking about. So there's a lot of books on these topics, but the idea of who he's talking to here, the elect is a specific group of people that were always of the seed of Abraham. Those that were given the original covenant at Mount Sinai were his that were elected. They were chosen of all peoples in the world. And that's who is called that when he uses his term throughout the entire body of scripture. That's a thing that's hidden that most people just don't get. But this letter is being addressed to the lost sheep that were, were being evangelized, if you will. But it says, set apart by Elohim the Father and preserved in Yahushua Mashiach, compassion and shalom and love be increased to you. Beloved ones, making all haste to write to you concerning our common deliverance, I felt the necessity to write to you, urging you to earnestly contend for the belief which was once for all delivered to the Kodashim. For certain men have slipped in, whose judgment was written about long ago, wicked ones perverting the favor of our Elohim for indecency and denying the only Adon Yahuwah and our Yahuwah, Yahushua Mashiach. And this was during the times they were alive. For some context, Simon the Magician would have been one of the proselytes that became a believer who beforehand was wowing people with magic and later when apostate again. He started schisms for the, the Simonians, if you want, if you want uh, to look into that. And even Simony is a it's an ecclesiastical crime from named after him. But back on point, you also have Nicholas of the seven ministers or deacons, if you will, just like you have the seven wandering stars or planets that are like that, the 12 constellations, like the 12 emissaries or apostles, the sun, like our Mashiach, the moon, like the kingdom. It was literally the, the lights being established the fourth day. Okay. Of those seven messengers that are ministers, the seven wandering stars, okay, two of them are not visible to the naked eye. And of the seven deacons that were established, Stephen was a martyr and Nicholas went apostate, both of them no longer visible within the assembly. So you have the same pattern in reality shown above as was given and they walked out in history. These are the things that you should be seeing more and more of as we go along. <clears throat> this is yet I intend to remind you though you once knew this that Yahuwah having delivered a people out of the land of Mitzrayim afterward destroyed those who did not believe and the messengers who did not keep their own principality but left their own dwelling he has kept in everlasting shackles under darkness for the judgment of the great day and that information is only found in the book of Hanok. Both the events when it happened, their judgment that was given at that time, and the animal apocalypse later on, which gives the, the, the judgment of that great day of when they were going to be judged. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar way to these, having given themselves over to whoring and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, undergoing judgment or judgmental, right, right ruling punishment of everlasting fire. In the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh. The dreamers that were rebuked in Yeremiahu that make his people go astray and call on the Lord, right? and reject authority, and speak evil of esteemed ones. But Mikael, the chief messenger in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moshe, presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yahuwah rebuke you. Yet these blaspheme that which they do not know, 
and that which they know naturally, like unreasoning beasts, in this they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, because they have gone in the way of Cain, who murdered his brother, just like Edom, just like the Roman assembly or the Nicolaitan movement that was festering up. Okay. And they gave themselves to the delusion of Bilam for a reward, using what they knew of the truth to help the enemies of it pervert the believers to conquer them. Exactly what the Nicolaitans did. And they perished in the rebellion of Korach. Korach was of the sons of Louis, who rose up against Moshe and Aharon in the wilderness and were consumed by fire in their offerings. All foretelling then condemning the Nicolaitan Roman Catholic movement that would come in. These are rocky reefs in your love feast feasting with you, feeding themselves without fear, waterless clouds borne about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead pulled up by the roots, wild waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, strange stars for whom blackness of darkness is kept forever. And Hanok, the seventh from Adam, also foretold of these saying, See, Yahuwah comes with his myriads of Kodashim to execute judgment on all, to punish all who are wicked among them concerning all their wicked works which they have committed in a wicked way, and concerning all the harsh words which wicked sinners have spoken against him. And we know that the Yahuwah that's coming that we will all see is our Mashiach. And it's the word of his mouth that will do in the sinners when he returns. Just like it's the word of his mouth that will judge them in the last day. And he said himself that all judgment was given into him. All authority was given to him from the Father. And Shaul explains later on that once all of creation has been subjected to our Mashiach and all is put under his feet, then he will yield sovereignty to his Father. And that is what we call... After the millennial reign, once Satan's were released and he does his thing and then fire destroys all the wicked, new, then the great white judgment or the great white throne judgment, and then the new creation, the renewed Shemaim, the renewed earth in which righteousness dwells and there is no more sin. At that point is when the father will reign with men. Until then, we have only done and will only do all things through his son. A lot of people get that confused, but you won't find anywhere in, his, in the scriptures that will be contrary to that. It says, These are grumblers, complainers who walk according to their own lusts, and their mouth speaks proudly, admiring faces for the sake of gain. But you, beloved ones, remember the word spoken before by the emissaries of our Yahuwah, Yahushua Mashiach. Because they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own wicked lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, not having the Ruach, or Ruach, if you will. Yet you, beloved ones, building yourselves up on your most set-apart belief, praying in the set-apart Ruach, keep yourselves in the love of Elohim looking for the compassion of our Yahuwah Yahushua unto everlasting life, and show compassion towards some who are doubting. Sorry, there's a typo I have to fix. But others deliver with fear, snatching them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you perfect before the presence of his esteem with exceeding joy, to the only Hakam or wise Elohim, our Deliverer, be esteem and greatness and might and authority, both now and forever. Amen. Continuing with the recognitions of Clement, this is a different book more than likely, but it's chapter 34, The Temptation of Mashiach. This is also Kepha preaching. 
It says, this we would have you know assuredly, that a demon has no power against a man unless one voluntarily submit himself to his, the demon's, desires. Whence even that one who is the prince of immorality approached him who, as we have said, is appointed of Yahuwah, king of Shalom, tempting him, and began to promise him all the kavod or esteem of the world, because he knew that when he had offered this to others for the sake of deceiving them, they had worshipped him. Therefore, disobedient as he was, and unmindful of himself, which indeed is a special peculiarity of immorality, he presumed that he should be worshipped by him by whom he knew that he was to be destroyed. In other words, he was delusional. He's, he's insane. And people willingly serve him. But it mentions elsewhere in the apostolic constitutions and otherwise that the wicked are blinded by their willing inequity. So you're literally made stupid through evil. And consequently, our Mashiach is the chokma or wisdom from Elohim. Intelligence, comprehension, knowledge, hence power. All of these things that the Ruach instills in you when his word is in you. Because he said, my, my word that I speak is Ruach and life. <clears throat> It says, therefore, our master, confirming the worship of one Yahuwah, answered him, It is written, you will worship Yahuwah, your Elohim, in him only will you serve. And he, terrified by this answer, and fearing lest the true obedience of the one and true Yahuwah should be restored, hastened straight away to send forth into this world false prophets and false apostles and false teachers who should speak indeed in the name of Mashiach, but should accomplish the will of the demon. And the expose of this fact is the book of Revelation. It foretells and exposes the Nicolaitan movement, how it was founded, what had been before 90 AD, what was and then what would come, just like the truth was revealed to them. That's how Revelation exposes this very thing. So, if anyone wants more information, I cannot recommend enough the Antichrist for Dummies video series on Christmas is a Lie YouTube channel. Uh, long story short, these false emissaries and apostles, they, they had their own books that they made too, which is also spoken of. And that is what we call the Nag Hammadi Library today. In that, you actually find the marching orders by Satan for how these people amalgamate the truth and lies and intentionally try to fulfill them. But continuing, false sent ones. So observe the greatest caution that you believe no teacher unless he bring from Yerushalayim the testimonial of Yaakob, Yahushua's brother, or of whosoever may come after him. For no one, unless he has gone up thither or there, and there has been approved as a fit and trustworthy teacher for preaching the word of Mashiach, unless I say he brings a testimonial thence, is by any means to be received. But let neither foreteller nor sent one, emissary, be looked for by you at this time apart from us. For there is one true foreteller. It's the one... It, it's called Nevi'ah Emmet, right? The foreteller of truth is a title for our Mashiach. Whose words we twelve sent ones preach. For he is the accepted year of Yahuwah. And the year is determined by the, the course of the sun. As we know from Yobelim, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and his own admission that he is the light of the world. And Psalm 19 says that the son is like the bridegroom, okay? So right here, whose word we twelve sent ones preach, for he is the accepted year of Yahuwah, having sent, or having us sent ones as his twelve months, which follow the, what we call the zodiac, the same way that the children, the twelve tribes, 
were represented by the zodiac, which you can still see in the heraldry of their arms that we carry down today. So there's a lot of that involved, but th this is the pattern I was just mentioning, okay? But for what reason the world itself was made or what diversities have occurred in it and why our master coming for its restoration has chosen and sent us 12 sent ones will be explained more at length at another time. Meantime, he has commanded us to go forth to preach and to invite you to the supper of the Shamayim king which the father has prepared for the marriage of his son. Some people think that the, the father is the one that married Yisrael. Another misconception, but when we realize there is one mediator, there is one that made the covenant, the one standing on Mount Sinai was Yahushua. He is another title or code name for him is the esteem of Yahuwah. Just like the word of Yahuwah, the voice of Yahuwah, the messenger Yahuwah on occasion. These are all titles for him. And he's the one that married Yisrael. He's the one that divorced them. He's the one that died to remarry them because otherwise it was impossible. And he fulfills the law. Uh, Ab willing, that's going to be making more sense to people. Sorry about that. So it says, for his son, and that we should give you wedding garments, that is, the favor of immersion, which whosoever obtains as a spotless robe with which he is to enter the supper of the king, ought to beware that it be not in any part of it stained with sin, and so he be rejected as unworthy and reprobate. Yet, the ways in which this garment may be spotted are these. If anyone withdraw from Yahuwah, the Father and Creator of all, receiving another teacher besides Mashiach, who alone is the trustworthy and true foreteller, and who has sent us twelve sent ones to preach the word. If anyone think otherwise than worthily of the substance of Yahuwah, which excels all things. These are the things that even fatally pollute the armor of immersion. But the things that pollute it in actions are these. Murders, adulteries, hatreds, erevis, and evil ambition. This is greed. Okay? And evil ambition. And the things that pollute at once the ruach and the body are these. To partake of the table of demons that is to taste things sacrificed or blood or a carcass that is strangled and if there be aught else that has been offered to demons so if it's been offered to a demon then a demon can inhabit it uh, the thing that a table that would be a sacrifice to demons would be like pig Swine, if you remember, is what he gave permission for Legion to go into. That's an established law on his word. So eating pig is a jurisdiction where a demon can enter you. It's pretty simple. The same thing with things that are openly sacrificed to pagan deities or something that has blood in it or a carcass, an animal that has been strangled instead of bleeding out. All right. Those things are what allows a demon to literally enter into you. Outside of that, you separate or you pollute your immersion by doing those evil things and by even thinking evil thoughts. So something to keep in mind. This is stuff that we, um, we see all the time going around, but we don't actually have a very, uh, very strong grasp of why. Father willing, his word being how reality functions, we can figure that out. All right. One more for us here from the recognitions of Clement. This is chapter, it looks like 42, called Interpretation of Scripture. Then Kepha commending his statement said, Ingenious men as I perceive, 
take many counterfeits looking much like truth from the things that are read or from the things that they read. And therefore great care is to be taken that when the Torah of Elohim is read, it be not read according to the comprehension of our own mind. Now that is so important. He'll go into detail about what that means, but just for context, right before he's making this reply, Clement had made a comment, and in the course of the comment, he mentions the fall of Troy and some things related to that. And while you have the common narrative for what happened with Troy, known amongst the Greeks with the Iliad and the Odyssey, those are perverted accounts of what you can read in the ancient history of Caldonia, which is the history of the, the survivors of Troy, all the way from their leaving Egypt, from the rest of the Hebrews there, and founding the city to 1290 AD, and the fall of their kingdom with Edward the Longshanks coming in and causing the secession war, or the later rebellion with Wallace in 1320. But that was the last time the, the MacDonald or the Caledonians were, were dominant in what we call Scotland today. In their history, it reads a little bit differently about how things happened in Troy. So what they commonly know isn't actually the truth. And that's what he's commenting on in this instance. But it plays out true in his word as well. So I thought that was pretty amazing because I don't know how much they were familiar with the history there. But I was just learning about it at the time when I was reading this. So he says, For there are many sayings in the set-apart scriptures that can be drawn to that sense that everyone has preconceived for himself, and this ought not to be done. Irenaeus calls it soundbite. Well, Irenaeus goes into detail about how they do that. They'll pick a thing, a little verse here and a little verse there and a little bit here and just throw it all together and make up their own context for what it means instead of using the sense of his word and how he defines it, which is what we are meant to do. Two or more witnesses establish in every matter. It says, for you ought not to seek a foreign and extraneous sense which you have brought from without which you may confirm from the authority of the scriptures, but to take the sense of truth from the scriptures themselves. And therefore it behooves you to learn the meaning of the scriptures from him who keeps it according to the truth handed down to him from his fathers, so that he can authoritatively declare what he has rightly received. Yet when one has received an entire and firm rule of truth from the scriptures, it will not be improper if he contribute to the establishment of true doctrine anything from common education and from liberal studies, which it may be he has attached himself to in his boyhood, yet so that when he has learned the truth, he renounce falsehood and pretense. Meaning once you've learned, you can use things you've learned to help propagate the truth which he is later on encouraging Clement and his two twin older brothers, Asita and, or Nesita and Aquila, to help him with preaching and to convince the multitudes to turn to the good news. They're very well studied in the Greek philosophy. They grew up educated or, um, you know, educated in the uh, modern education of you can say hellenized if you will but they are also believers you get more into their story um who is involved in it there's actually the woman the widow that's mentioned in the good news accounts is the one that adopted them and there you find that out somewhere else i have to find it for you because i don't i don't remember it exactly on my head i don't want to just quote things that i can't pull up but i believe it's in I believe it's in the homilies that it talks about that or, or the recognitions earlier, but it mentions the lady and the one that was in the book of Acts is also the lady that adopted them and raised them and taught them the principles of Torah observance as youths 
but they ended up getting involved with Simon the Magician as as younglings and going along with him in his uh, escapades of magic and and uh, using demons and whatnot. But getting back on track here. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. Let a man regard us as servants of Mashiach and trustees of the secrets of Elohim. For the rest, it is sought in trustees that those should be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a small matter that I should be judged by you or by a man's court but not even myself, I judge. Now, this isn't, I don't want to cut into this too much, but when you go over this again, or anyone listening, keep in mind that these are multifaceted pieces of information. Knowledge is ever, ever expounding from his word. We can't get to the end of it. So while our topic of focus is specifically who to listen to and how to, to discern what is true, you can also look at this from the legal aspect. Our country, America, Britain, Australia, the common law countries are literally countries that are supposed to be having the biblical common the, the biblical law actually practiced. People don't know this too much anymore because we've lost a lot of our history. It hasn't been taught to us, but it is the truth. The Constitution and our founders were is based mostly off of the Bible. It is a covenant with the Almighty. And our founder's intention was that all men would be subject to Yahuwah alone, obedient to his word, virtuous, keeping the Ten Commandments at the very least. But the common law is literally the Ten Commandments and the judgments that the Exodus 21 through 23 was codified by Alfred the Great, he got it from the Latin translation that was originally in the Celtic that they had gotten all the way from the uh, King Mal Malmontis, I believe, who was a Celtic king in 500s BC, who first codified it. And it was the scriptures, the Ten Commandments and the judgments of scripture. So that Celtic king would have been of the northern kingdom's dispersion and making his way over to the island at that time the information was known in that britain by 500s bc is my point and that is the common law of our country all of our founders were familiar with that even if we're not and everything in his word is how we base our law and our documents on so trustees fiduciary uses and how they should be affected and judged by courts and men are established right here and actually how our constitution is supposed to or our government is supposed to function that was my point but i don't want to get too far into that it's another rabbit hole these are things that you can think of no matter where you're looking and it's not the only ways that you can see or learn from his word just to keep in mind so it says, let a man regard us as servants of Mashiach and trustees of the secrets of Elohim. For the rest, it is sought in trustees that those should be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a small matter that I should be judged by you or by a man's court. But not even myself I judge, for I am not conscious of any against myself. Yet I am not declared right by this. But he who judges me is Yahuwah. He who causes it to be. So do not judge any at all before the time, until Yahuwah comes, who shall bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the thoughts of the hearts. And then each one's praise shall come from Elohim. And these brothers I have applied in a figure to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you might learn not to think beyond what is written. He mentioned these things to them and went into detail about the situation so it could be established in writing to reign in their thoughts, to make every thought subject to Mashiach, who is 
the touchable, fillable communication, the word made flesh, right? So he made this whole part and tied in that whole story with their events to get them back in line to not think beyond what is written, because that's the point. So that none of you be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you to differ? Who, who makes you to comprehend things in a different way than another? And if and what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already satisfied. You are already enriched. You have reigned as kings apart from us. And I desire indeed you did reign that we also might reign with you meaning he he desires that we actually do it so that we can have our reward. That's a theme that we'll get to more and more, but all of history has been working towards he's waiting for us to do what he said. He's not going to return in enmity. <laughs> and we're getting the consequences of our choices. All right, I think one more here, and then we'll see how we're doing. This is second Kepha or 2 Peter 1, 17 through 21. For when he received respect and esteem from Elohim the Father, such a voice came to him from the excellent esteem. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I did delight. Or another version calls him the elect, right? Which is a title that is foretold in uh, somewhere. I have to look again. And then it also mentions that he is his daily delight, which is alluding to Proverbs 8, where he was his delight day by day. The one who preceded all creation and was the firstborn of it. it says, And we heard this voice come, or which came from Shemaim, when we were with him on the set-apart mountain. And we have the foretelling, or the prophetic word right the foretelling word made more certain which you do well to heed is a light that shines in a dark place until the yom or day dawns and the dawn star arises in your hearts knowing this first that no foretelling of scripture came to be of one's own interpretation for foretelling never came by the desire of man but men of Elohim spoke, being moved by the set-apart Ruach. Right? Meaning it was not of themselves. It was not something they just did. And this dawn star is actually another title for our Mashiach. The foretelling of Zakariyahu in the book of Luke, where it says the dawn stars will arise, it was arising, was another mention of it. And I believe it is in... It's in one of the foretellers in the Septuagint version. They use dawn star instead of, um, I think maybe morning star for one of the one of them. But I have to double check that. All right, just one moment. All right, so continuing from the recognitions of Clement, this one is from Book Ten, part of Chapter Thirteen, and. I don't always quote everything because it's not relevant to what I'm trying to share. I do encourage everyone, read the recognitions of Clement. Although, be mindful, you will be accountable for the knowledge that you, you read. You should treasure the truth and uh, not be flippant with it. There's a If you get the version that was written by Jackson Snyder, he calls it the Nazarene Acts of the Apostles. He has some addendums, some added text from the the Clementine homilies, which you can look at that part if you want to. And then he also has some epistles that were attached. As one of them is a letter from Kepha to Yaakov, the overseer of the Yerushalayim assembly and the brother of our Mashiach. And he actually requests that his writings, his preaching that Clement was writing and sending to them, not be distributed or made public for just anyone to read, but that only the initiated or those who swear, not swear, but those who adjure by the heavens, earth, and you know all things in the very breath, 
that they will be obedient to the one who gives them this and not deviate from the truth in it. And the importance of doing that was because people were messing and corrupting his words already while he was still alive. And if they think to do that while he's living, just think of what they'll do afterwards. So that's the reason why the recognitions of Clement were not in what we call the Bible or the commonly open to everyone's scriptures. It was one of the hidden writings for the, the wise and intelligent, if you will. So that in mind, that, that's a little cravat. Anyone who reads this, you will be accountable for the knowledge that you are learning. So you want to be mindful of that and seriously be um, be willing to conform your, wor your worldview to his if you read it, right? Either way, then Kepha ordered them to be admitted, for the place was large and convenient. And when they had come in, Kepha said to us, If any one of you desires, let him address the people and discourse concerning idolatry. To whom I, Clement, answered, Your great benignity, goodness, right? Beneficence, your benefit, right? Your great benignity and gentleness and patience towards all encourages us so that we dare speak in your presence and ask what we please. And therefore, as I said, the gentleness of your disposition invites and encourages all to undertake the precepts of delivering doctrine. This I never saw before in anyone else, but in you only, with whom there is neither envy nor indignation. Or what do you think? Then Kepha said, These things come not only from envy or indignation, but sometimes there is bashfulness in some person, persons, sorry, fearing that they may not be able to answer fully the questions that may be proposed, and so they avoid the discovery of their want of skill. But no one ought to be ashamed of this, because there is no man who ought to profess that he knows all things. For there is only one who knows all things, even he who has also made all things. And that's the Father. Our Mashiach didn't make himself, as he, he's going to explain right here. For if our Master declared that he knew not the day and the hour whose signs even he foretold and referred the whole to the Father, how will we account it dishonorable? to confess that we are ignorant of some things, since in this we have the example of our Master. Yet this only we profess, that we know those things that we have learned from the true foreteller, and that those things have been delivered to us by the true foreteller, which he determines to be sufficient for man's knowledge. So we don't have to know everything, we just have to know what he said. Right? Live by every word of his mouth. Then I, Clement, went on to speak thus. At Tripoli's, when you were disputing against the nations, my master Kepha, I greatly wondered at you, that although you were instructed by your father according to the fashion of the Hebrews and in observances of your own Torah, and were never polluted by the studies of Greek learning, you argued so magnificently and so incomparably, and that you even touched upon some things concerning the histories of the false mighty ones, which are usually declaimed in the theaters. In talking about the history that was taught to the people was taught through Greek theater. It was the poets and the philosophers that would promote the stories and mythologies of their their mighty ones that were so grotesque. Right. He goes into detail about what they are and why they happen. Again, I highly encourage you guys to read this if you want to. He says, but as I perceived that their fables and blasphemies are not so well known to you, I will discourse upon these in your hearing, repeating them from the very beginning, if it pleases you. Then says Kepha, say on, you do well to assist my preaching. Then said I, I will speak therefore because you order me, not by way of teaching you, 
but of making public what foolish opinions the nations entertain of their false mighty ones. Yet when I was about to speak, Nasita, biting his lip, beckoned me, or beckoned to me to be silent. And when Kepha saw, it, saw him, he said, Why would you repress his liberal disposition and noble nature, that you would have him be silent for my honor, which is nothing? Or do you not know that if all tribes, after they have heard from me the preaching of the truth, and have believed, would betake themselves to teaching, they would gain the greater esteem for me, if indeed you think me desirous of esteem. For what so esteemed as to prepare taught ones for Mashiach, not who will be silent, but or and will be delivered alone, but who will speak what they have learned and will do good to others. I desire indeed that both you, Nasita, and you, beloved Aquila, would aid me in preaching the word of Elohim, and the rather because those things in which the nations err are well known to you, and not only, or sorry, and not you only, but all who hear me. I desire, as I have said, so to hear and to learn, that they may be able also to teach. For the world needs many helpers, by whom men may be recalled from error. When he is thus spoken, he said to me, Go on then, Clement, with what you have begun. And that was the importance of sharing this section. He's establishing how it should be done. You first learn from the ones who know, and then you can add your own or help as well. Same book. This is Kepha speaking. Okay, 47. It's a trustworthy saying worthy of all acceptation. Or ex yeah, acceptation. Yet if anyone desires to learn exactly the truth of our preaching, let him come to hear. Let him ascertain what Yahuwah Yahushua is. And then at length all doubtfulness will cease to him, unless with obstinate mind he resist those things that he finds to be true. Or, yeah, what the true foreteller, sorry. For there are some whose only object it is to gain the victory in any way whatever, and who seek praise for this rather than their deliverance. These ought not to have a single word addressed to them, lest both the noble word suffer injury and condemn to ageless death him who is guilty of the wrong done to it. This is not throwing your pearls before swine, right? For what is there in respect of which anyone ought to oppose our preaching, or in respect of which the word of our preaching is found to be contrary to the belief of what is true and honorable? It says that Yahuwah the Father, the Creator of all, is to be honored, as also His Son, who alone knows Him and His will and who alone is to be believed concerning all things that he has enjoined. For he alone is the Torah and the Torah giver, and the righteous judge, whose law decrees that Yahuwah, who is the Elohim of all, is to be honored by a sober, chaste, righteous, and merciful existence and that all expectation is to be placed in him alone. 2 Timothy 3, 1-17 Yet know this, that in the last days hard times shall come, for men shall be lovers of self, lovers of silver, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence but denying its power, and turn away from these. 
For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And as Yochain and Mamrin opposed Moshe, so do these also oppose the truth. Men of corrupt minds found worthless concerning the belief, but they shall not go on further, for their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that of those men became. Meaning your errant doctrine and your, your beliefs and practices will be opposed to what's loving and true. You won't walk in the way that he put, and it'll be evident. Yet you did closely follow my teaching, the way of life, the purpose, the belief, the patience, the love, the endurance, the persecutions, the sufferings which came to me at Antioch, at Iconia, and at Lustra. What persecutions I bore, yet out of them all, Yahuwah delivered me. And indeed, all those desiring to live reverently in Mashiach Yahushua shall be persecuted or shall face tribulation. But evil men and impostors shall go on to the worse, leading astray and being led astray. But you stay in what you have learned and trusted, having known from whom you have learned, and that from a babe you have known the set-apart scriptures which are able to make you wise for deliverance through belief in Mashiach Yahushua. All scripture is breathed out by Elohim. All scripture. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Recognitions of Clement, Hanok, Yobelim, 4th Ezra, 2nd Baruch, all the Apocrypha, the Maccabees, all the things that were testified to by the patriarchs, held to by the congregations, kept by the Zadok library in, in Qumran, right? These things are, are scripture, okay? These are the words from his mouth by the inspiration of his Ruach through other men, just like it mentions. All scripture is breathed out by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for setting straight, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work. Getting right back to the beginning, what's the purpose? To fear Elohim and guard his commands. It's the whole duty of man. All right, this is 2nd Kepha, chapter 3, 1 through 18. This is now, beloved ones, the second letter I write to you, in which I stir up your sincere mind. To remember the words previously spoken by the set-apart foretellers and of the command of the Master and Deliverer by your emissaries, knowing this first, that mockers shall come in the last days with mocking, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, fathers fell asleep, all continues as from the beginning of creation. For they choose to have this hidden from them. That the Shemaim were of old, or were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by the word of Elohim, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And the present Shemaim and the earth are treasured up by the same word, being kept for fire to a yom of judgment and destruction of wicked men. Now, right there, that's a self-evident fact that anyone can think about. They choose to hide the fact that the, there's water in and out of our world. There's a firmament and our world was flooded. These are all demonstrable facts. You can look up what that means. It means you can repeat it. You can demonstrate it. It's provable. It, it's it's reality. It's of substance. It's not a theory. It's what his word literally says, and it's literally proven. But they choose to hide that. Okay. <clears throat> 
Yet, beloved ones, let not this one be hidden from you, that with Yahuwah one day is as a thousand years, or like a thousand years, and a thousand years as or like one day. Yahuwah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward us, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's that parable, the creation account parable. One day is as a thousand years. Each work or each thousand year period, each day is what he's doing until the millennial reign. It's not one day is a thousand years, but it's like it. It's a parable. It resembles it. That's first mentioned in Yobelim. It's established in Genesis with uh, um, Adam and what happens in his life. It's explained elsewhere as well. Mentioned by Moshe, mentioned in the Psalms, also mentioned here by Kepha. <clears throat> it says, But the Yom of Yahuwah shall come as a thief in the night in which the Shamayim or firmament shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with intense heat. Earth, fire, wind, water shall melt with intense heat, the elements. And the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing all these are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be in set-apart behavior and fear? looking for and hastening the coming of the Yom of Elohim, through which the Shemaim shall be destroyed, being set on fire. And the elements melt with intense heat. Yet, according to his promise, we wait for a renewed Shemaim and a renewed earth in which righteousness dwells. So then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by him in shalom, spotless and perfect, and reckon the patience of our Yahuwah as deliverance, as also our beloved brother Shaul wrote to you, according to the hokma given to him, as also in all letters speaking in them concerning these, in which some are hard to comprehend which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the other scriptures. You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the delusion of the lawless. But grow in the favor and knowledge of our Yahuwah and Deliverer, Yahushua Mashiach. To him be the esteem both now and to the day that abides, Amen. All right, one moment. All right, and I think with that, we are going to wrap up for today, and we'll probably finish reading this next Shabbat. Please keep in mind the whole purpose of this is who we should listen to and how do we learn the truth. As you see so far, there's a specific chain of command and really, when you go back, you can find it all the way from the beginning. Moshe was foretold to the people that there was one coming they had to listen to. And if you didn't listen to him, you'd be cut off. And that one was our Mashiach. He declared, he, he sent his taught ones out and said, anyone that won't hear you, it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for them. His taught ones assembled the assemblies and gave that authority to the overseers. Right, that were chosen by unanimous consent of the governed. It wasn't any dictator, to, no, no evil going on at all. But it was established that authority was all the way down that way. So very important. And that's in the Apostolic Constitutions and other things as well. But this part, just using the words here, you can learn and discern what you should listen to and how you should determine what is true by reading Scripture. So thank you for your time. We'll pick this up next week, and you'll have a wonderful Shabbat and uh, uh, Shavuot Tov, a great week ahead.